there is a author. We've mentioned it, mentioned this author several times. He's known as the father of cybernetics, Norbert Weiner or Weiner. And uh, he has a book titled God and Gullum Inc. A comment on certain points where cybernetics impinges on religion. And the book cover here, the original book cover is literally the all seeing eye. Mm. And uh, the, the, is that the nuclear uh, kind of similar to a nuclear it's, thing? Too. Yeah. It's almost like a, either a nuclear thing or it even kind of looks like a film reel. Film maybe. reel. Yeah. And the whole idea here is that the human being will eventually become uh, sort of the technological commodity where the robots are sort of the slaves at first. Eventually, you know, we will become a resource to the machines kind of thing. This was written back in the, I think, the 40s or 50s or something like that. So it was written half a century ago, and they were already on top of it. Um, and so that's part of the agenda. You know, it's, it's not really surprising, but uh, I just thought I'd bring it up because I think it all ties together to this longer agenda that's been going on for quite a while. And now that they have the infrastructure to tear down, to build up this stuff again, uh, just in the same way they did with 9-11, the same way they did with... Pearl Harbor, the same, you know, any kind of war. Um, I think we're seeing the same thing being set up here. So, yeah, just, uh, you know, information to keep everyone apprised and, and uh, aware of where we're headed and what we're doing in terms of, or not us, but what the elite, the world elite are doing and how, how long it's been planned. You know, it's just been, yeah. it's been part of the agenda for a long time. And speaking of which, uh, let's go into the Wachshin stuff because it ties into the whole uh, yeah. war game Real stuff. Real quick, mm -hmm. uh, for those who are more interested in the uh, occult uh, connections with World War II, um, just looking at Aleister Crowley and some of the things he was doing on behalf of the UK government, mm. uh, ritual-wise. Yes. Uh, you, it'll you start there. It'll fall. <laughs> you'll yeah. make it to the end. Well, in Age of Deceit 3, I talk about the Macy Conference, mm -hmm. where... Yeah all these cyberneticians and mathematicians and all these people got together and they did this like big seance. Yep. It's, it's like not even, it's drum. not even like hidden. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did the seance, uh, the cybernetic the human seance. skin drum, yeah. the all sorts of weird stuff <laughs> yeah. he was doing. Okay. So, uh, moving into wax sheens here. Wax sheen. Wax sheen. Wax sheen. Wax sheen. A pandemic special. And let me, uh, let me just run here. I'll do it quickly, Basil, and then we'll get into uh, more, some of the stories. Yep. Um, th this, is, uh, this document, it's been, you know, it's been shared around if you're paying attention. The SPARS pandemic 2025 to 2028, a futuristic scenario for public health risk communicators. And this was uh, the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security who published this in the year 2017. I think this was what uh, Fauci was talking about when he's in 2017. Remember, he was like, there will be a, a, a global pandemic with this presidency or whatever uh, it was. He said Trump will experience a surprise, a surprise pandemic, pandemic yeah. or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think he was reading or part of this event and he was all pumped about it, maybe. Um, okay. A couple things to point out here uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with this document. It's out there. Again, it was published in 2017. Um, let me uh, I have some parts. I, I can't highlight PDFs, so I have to take notes and then look up the spots here. Okay. Generation purpose. Uh, the time frame for the scenario, the years 2025 to 2028 was selected first, and then major socioeconomic, demographic, technological, and environmental trends likely to have emerged by that period were identified specifically two dominant trends likely to influence regulatory and public responses to future public health emergencies were selected one varying degrees of access to information technology and two varying levels of fragmentation among populations along social political religious ideological and cultural lines the scenario matrix was then constructed illustrating four possible worlds shaped by these trends with consideration given to both constant and unpredictable driving forces. And then they chose one. What's interesting is they were planning this for 2025 to 2028. It looks like they released it early, you know, 2020, basically. 
and most of the stuff in this document has already happened. I mean, it's crazy mm. when you read through this thing that it's like, wow, they uh, they really just had it planned uh, all the way through here. So the next segment I want to read is from page 43. It's called Lovers and Haters. And uh, so just keep in mind, this is written as uh, as a sort of a, a play, right? I think it's called Wargaming, where it's like... A, uh, they're basically playing they're pretending like it's actually happening so it's written in that way so the first paragraph talks about the coravax the coronavirus a coronavirus vaccination campaign it says early on in the coravax vaccination campaign anti-vaccination groups began emerging on social media platforms these groups initially came from four primary sources then they kind of get into you know these different groups here the muslims and african americans and you know whatever with the exception of this last group, none of the anti-vaccination movements were cohesively organized initially, existing primarily in small, isolated pockets across the country. The general anti-vaccination proponents, however, existed as a core national group long before the SPARS pandemic. The SPARS is the name of the theoretical uh, uh, pandemic here, which became COVID-19. Following the 2015 measles outbreak in the U.S., this group united online. By 2016, they had created several primary Facebook groups and numerous Twitter accounts and began using hashtags like hashtag no vaccines for me and hashtag vaccines kill. The anti-vaccination movement migrated to ZapQ. Remember, this huh. is 2017, okay? Yeah. ZapQ, that's like right around the time Q actually came out. Uh, the anti-vaccination movement migrated to ZapQ upon its emergence in 2022 due to its ability to combine feeds from across multiple platforms, including real-time text pictures and video messages for members, as well as select traditional media posts, such as videos, text, and streaming news feeds on a single interface, blah, blah, blah. Additionally, through ability to control group membership, these groups ensured that they would not expose a pro-vaccine, quote, propaganda from pharmaceutical companies the federal government, or public health or medical authorities. By 2026, many core members of the anti-vaccine movement obtained their national news almost exclusively from anti-vaccine ZapQ sites. Isn't it interesting how already within this documentation about a pandemic is a internet cyber component that's, uh, you know, just uh, not prophesied necessarily, but like, you know, predicted or or uh, considered as part of the problem here. Last yeah, section. Well, real quick, just mm -hmm. to, to comment on that. You know, it, it one of the s surprising things for me with the Fauci emails, uh, first of all, not a lot of it was surprising. Yeah, it was almost all. entirely uninteresting to yeah. see that, yes, we've all been right about Fauci, Fauci the whole time. But there were several times where he and his buddies were sending – uh, like zero hedge articles back and forth <laughs> to each other, and like we're tracking the online yeah. uh, criticisms that they were gathering. So you know, we kind of have this idea in the sort of indie space that, uh, or fringe space, whatever you want to call it, that it's sort of you know going under the radar. That uh, oh, they wouldn't be paying attention to any of this crazy stuff we're talking about. It no, it's the Fauci emails showed that they are very much in tune with sort of the underground online information space yeah yeah and i'm glad you brought up uh, fauci because in the section chapter 19 spars aftermath you know this whole email release fauci leaks all this kind of stuff uh that was seems to be part of the agenda as well here's what it says on page 66 as the pandemic tapered off several influential politicians and agency representatives came under fire for sensationalizing the severity of the event for perceived political gain. As mm -hmm. with many public health interventions, successful efforts to reduce the impact of the pandemic created the illusion that the event was not nearly as serious as experts suggested it would be. Wow. Isn't that crazy? That's like exactly kind of what just happened here. Uh, I know. I mean, again, remember, this is this is a hypothetical report that came out in 2017. 2017, yeah. And they, yeah, they're 
They're just on top of, I mean, it shows how much calculation goes into these things and just how much they expect the public response. Yeah. Uh, They have this theoretical president, Archer. President Archer's detractors in the Republican Party seize the opportunity to publicly disparage the president and his administration's response to the pandemic, urging voters to elect, quote, a strong leader with the best interests of the American people at heart. A widespread social media movement led primarily by outspoken parents of affected children, which this document goes into like uh, these kids that like took the vaccine and vomited and that video went viral and, and all this kind of stuff, coupled with widespread distrust of big pharma, supported the narrative that the development of SPARS MCM, which is uh, the medical countermeasures, was unnecessary and driven by a few profit seeking individuals. Conspiracy theories also proliferated across social media, suggesting that the virus had been purposely created and introduced to the population by drug companies or that it had escaped from a government lab secretly testing bioweapons. And uh, again, the link to this document will be in the show notes at CanaryCryNewsTalk.com. Uh, if you read it, it's crazy. It's, it just reads like the exact... Thing of what we've been living it's like oh okay they just uh took this script and uh you know <laughs> just laid it out in reality uh, one little yeah. section here as the investigators grew in intensity several high-ranking officials at the cdc and fda were forced to step down and withdraw from government in order uh. to quote spend more time with their families Really? Oh, yeah. All the way down. So this is literally just a script. Oh, it's, it's a complete script. It's, it's just unreal. a full-on script that they followed through this pandemic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That is spooky, And look man. at this exhausted employees of these agencies. Remember what they said about Fauci? Yeah, a couple Fauci's days ago? just so He's tired, so, so exhausted. <laughs> Many of yeah. whom worked long six or seven days a week throughout the pandemic simply wanted to put the whole response behind them. Little desire remained on the part of decision makers or those who served in the trenches during the response to rehash the events of the past several years. Wow. Yeah. It's a script. They it's just script. wrote out the script in 2017. That is crazy. And you know, they're trying to present it as like, oh, they played this little war game and this is what happened. And, uh, you know, this is, they just knew it would happen because they played this Dungeons and Dragons campaign in 2017. And, and, uh, it, but it's also got the weird connection with like the hive mind, mm-hmm. uh, stuff, the big data conglomeration of, um, Oracle, AI mm-hmm. Oracle stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's very it's interesting because it's either an expression of sort of the uh, big data oracle uh, technocracy idea that happened to play out or the, you know, a script that they wrote or maybe a, maybe a mixture of both. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the big data gets fed in and then that writes the script for how to respond. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty wild how they were able to just know so much in 2017 <sighs> in this hypothetical scenario. Yeah, it really is incredible. Yep. All right. Well, um, let's check in with our buddies, uh, Francis Collins and uh, Daddy Fauci. You know, it's so three amigos. (laughs) Third amigo. Oh, yeah, it's the three amigos. You know, it's funny, just to make another kind of random connection here, I, you know, we I kind of tongue-in-cheek call these war games they play Dungeons & Dragons campaigns, because that's what it is. They're sort of just like role-play tabletop games that mm-hmm. they do, or at least that's the what they claim it to be. Yeah. And, you know, traditionally, now, uh, role-playing, tabletop role-playing games have been going through a renaissance in the past few years, but traditionally the idea is that, you know, Dungeons and Dragons is for nerds, and of course, that's uh, you know that's the three amigos right there: Francis Collins, Daddy Fauci, and Bill Gates. Two, the, two down, one to go. 
really if you think about it fellows in the world that's true francis collins has got to be looking over his shoulder <laughs> getting pretty worried after the downfall of gates and now uh, fauci under fire all right so uh bringing this article from the gateway pundit uh sort of infamous uh, conservative uh, outlet here but um you know what nobody else was really talking about it so let's see what they got to say this is from the gateway pundit.com the headline dr fauci Fauci's boss refutes his claims, admits NIH was funding Wuhan lab, and, quote, we had no control over what they were doing. Uh-oh. In May, Senator Rand Paul confronted Dr. Tony Fauci. <laughs> Tony. Funny, they call him Tony. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, you know, the, after the emails came out where we see that Anthony Fauci has been signing all of his emails, Tony. It's like, this guy just really wants to be called Tony, so I guess we'll call him Tony. Maybe that's his, like, uh, ooh. Now, this is from Gateway Pundit, so it's not necessarily sort of a uh, an expression of the mainstream media hive mind. But it would be interesting to see if the mainstream starts calling him Tony, because it's kind of like a... It would almost signal like the fall from grace, like where before he was Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, but uh, changing the name to Tony Fauci is kind of like a, a term of shame or familiarity. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Know lo- mm-hmm. This is not a, a an indictment against anybody named Tony or Anthony. One mm-hmm. of the definitions for Tony is... A medallion awarded annually by a professional organization for notable achievements in the theater, which, you know, the yes. Tony Awards. Right. But, but it's just, uh, you know, maybe he's just a good actor, too. It's just, yeah, yeah okay, good, good catch. In May, Senator Rand Paul confronted Dr. Tony Fauci for funding gain-of-function research in the U.S. and then later at a lab in Wuhan, China. Dr. Fauci refuted the claims under oath, despite the fact that there are documents that prove the U.S. was funding the Wuhan lab under his direction. As the Gateway Pundit has reported since early 2020, the Wuhan lab uh, was likely the source of the coronavirus outbreak, and Dr. Fauci was funding the lab for years. On Wednesday, Dr. Francis Collins, the director of the National Institute of Health and Dr. Fauci's boss, admitted to radio host Hugh Hewitt that the U.S. collaborated with the Wuhan Virology Laboratory. Oops. And here's, here's the block quote here. Well, we when we gave a grant, when we give a grant, Hugh, it has terms attached to it of what it is that the grantee is supposed to be doing with those funds. And we require annual reports to see whether that, in fact, is what they have been doing. And we trust the grantee, to be honest and not deceptive. The grant <laughs> funds that went to Wuhan, which were a subcontract from EcoHealth, were very specifically aimed to try to categorize viruses that they could isolate from bats in Chinese caves, which we had a good reason to want to know more about, given SARS and MERS that had come out of there. And so we basically had those criteria attached to the grant. And, of course, the amount of money that we were providing to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, I'm sure, was a tiny fraction of their total funding. And we had no control over what else they were doing with those funds. That's another thing we'd like to know more about, and an investigation might potentially tell us. Collins goes on to admit that the Chinese Communist Party is, in fact, involved in the Wuhan lab, but attempts to play down their influence. So there you go. He's said it right there. After Fauci (laughs) first got caught lying, saying he didn't fund it, now Fauci's boss is coming out and being like, yeah, I mean, they are... (laughs) We gave them the money, and uh, we really have no idea what they used the money for. But, uh, I mean, how would anybody know, (laughs) really? You know, 